Okay, today's scripture comes from the book of 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. As always, it'll be on the screen for you, and I invite you to read God's word along with me. 1 Kings chapter 3, 1 through 15. Oh, I'm in 2 Kings. Here we go. Then Solomon formed a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her to the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of Yahweh and the wall around Jerusalem. The people were still sacrificing on the high places because there was no house built for the name of Yahweh until those days. Now Solomon loved Yahweh, walking in the statutes of his father David, except he sacrificed and burnt incense on the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. In Gibeon, Yahweh appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and God said, Ask what you wish me to give you. Then Solomon said, You have shown great loving kindness to your servant David, my father, according as he walked before you in truth and righteousness and uprightness of heart towards you. And you have reserved for him this great loving kindness that you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O Yahweh, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, yet I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Your servant is in the midst of your people, which you have chosen, a great people who are too many to be numbered or counted. So give your servant an understanding, a heart to judge, your people to discern between good and evil, for who is able to judge this great people of yours? It was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. God said to him, Because you have asked this thing and have not asked for yourself long life, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself discernment to understand justice, behold, I have done according to your words. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart, so that there may have been no one like you before you, nor shall one like you arise after you. I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there will not be any among the kings like you all your days. If you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and commandments as your father David walked, then I will prolong your days. Then Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and burned offerings, offered burnt offerings and made peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Jenny, we're going to invite you up. Honey, can you grab that mic right there for her? Good morning, everyone. My name is Jenny Yu, and I'm one of the young adult members of RK. A little context about me, I have grown up most of my life at this church and served as a PK. In the past, I have been on many mission trips to places such as New Orleans, Mexico, and Guatemala. With each mission, I'd learned lots of things, but I think this last mission I've learned the most. This past June, I had the opportunity to be a part of the mission team to Thailand. Prior to the actual trip, we had some time to meet as a team and work together to figure out what it is we would actually be doing. Since it was our church's first time going on a mission trip to Chiang Mai, there were many things that we did not know. As the day got closer, the more unsure I became of the kind of situations we would be put in. The day of the departure had finally come and we had a bit of a rough start. From our connecting flight being delayed to us being stranded overnight in Bangkok, thankfully God was with us and allowed us to be flexible with our plans. As someone who usually likes to know what is going on and have control over the situation, having to adapt on the field did not come easy to me. For example, on Saturday, Chuchan's mom had asked me to sing with the praise team for Sunday service. Considering I'm not part of the praise team in RK and have not sung on stage for church in a long time, it made me question if I'm even capable of doing so. Thankfully, the members of the praise team were encouraging and helped me through the process. However, about 15 minutes before Sunday service was to begin, Chuchan's mom had asked me to sing another hymn that I am not too familiar with and in Korean. This, to, this proved to be a much more difficult challenge because the other members of the praise team would not be singing it in Korean. With the time I had, I tried my best to memorize the song as much as I could. While singing the song, I tried to my hardest to remember that this was all for God and he does not care if I sing it perfectly because I am not made perfect. I am just a person with many flaws and must remember um, that I can do nothing without him. When it comes to things I fear, there are not many things. However, I would say birds are on top of that list. 
In my past, I've had some bad experiences with birds that have caused this fear. At times, this fear can come, uh, become too much and it sends me into a panic. One factor I did not think about when going to the hill tribes was nature. In all the tribes, there were wild chickens roaming around, which is the literal definition of free range. Because of my fear, I could not even walk to the restroom alone. The chickens in that area have a habit of following people, um, thinking that they will be given food. Thankfully, my team members were understanding and would walk with me to the restroom. However, as we were about to leave the hill tribes, I had gathered the courage to go alone. I know that courage did not come from me. It was through Christ I was able to do so. I had walked past three water buffalo and four chickens, thanks be to God. Another challenge that our entire team faced was using a toilet. In the compound we were staying in uh, with the children, there was only one regular public toilet. Unfortunately, this toilet had no door and was in view of the whole dining hall and the laundry, uh, laundry area. There were other toilets, but those were all squatty potties and most of them still didn't have a door. Um, we also had sleeping arrangements in the sanctuary, which at times could have been a challenge if our team had not been so small. After going on missions, many of us hit a spiritual high that slowly fades away as we go back to reality. I am also guilty of this. However, I'm trying my best to do what I can to continue to serve God. Um, one of the goals is to raise $20,000 to give to the Thailand missionaries to fund a long-term project. In order for them to continue to host mission teams, especially from RK, our vision is to build a small living quarters equipped with two bathrooms. Um, this will help accommodate with the missions teams when present and also free up the sanctuary to use it for times of worship. Um, if you would like to donate or help fund the project, just please message me or let me know in person. Um, now I'm just gonna go over things I'm thankful for. I am thankful for every member of this team who each has a purpose in God's work. I am also thankful for our team that got along very well and the dynamic slash chemistry that was the way it was. I give thanks to all the people in the Hill Tribes that accepted us with open arms and for God who allowed us to worship him in unity. I would especially like to thank Chichan's parents for hosting us and for all the hard work they do with the community. For a country that is majority Buddhist, it takes much time and effort to build a strong foundation in the community um, that respects his teaching of the gospel to children. While all the other kids must pay respect to the statue before school, the children under Chichen's parents' care are exempt from participating in because it goes against Christian beliefs. These children are all so special and have such beautiful souls that when I left, I felt like a piece of me was missing. Even though we did not have much time with them, I cherish every moment we had. My favorite moments are from when we would walk the children to and from school. They were all so full of joy um, to go and learn and gain more knowledge. I only pray that they continue to be happy and healthy with Christ in their hearts. And lastly, I thank you guys for all listening. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Jenny. And again, I look forward to hearing so many more of the testimonies from the other teams. Uh, it's just really, truly a joy. All right, um, as you know, if you've been here, we're in our Biblical Hero series for the summer. And for the next little bit, we're going to be studying uh, the person of Solomon. Um, oh, no. Can you go to the title slide? Thank you. Uh, and so we're going to be spending some time with Solomon this week and next week, and then kind of as we finish off the summer looking at his wisdom. Now, uh, Preparation for this part was, and this sermon was really difficult for the whole thing. Uh, and the reason why is because as I was studying Solomon, and, and just a prior note, I had committed to somebody that I was going to look at Solomon, so I was kind of roped in and I couldn't really change. But as I looked at Solomon, I, I, I had a bit of a, a crisis because uh, this feeling and this thought came over me that I just couldn't, couldn't, didn't know what to do with. And here's the thought. In Solomon, I had found everything that I wished I could be and have, while at the exact same time, everything I wished to avoid at all costs. And I didn't know what to do with this. And the more and more I looked at him, the more and more I felt my heart being tugged in opposite directions. Like, do I love this dude and do I want to be like him? Or do I absolutely despise this guy and just want to run as far away from his example as humanly possible? 
And the more I looked, I wanted to love Solomon. I wanted to be like him and, 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 and have his successes and things because his highs and his goods are so epic. Like they are so much higher than the majority of the people on earth will ever get to. Let me just give you a little glimpse, okay? He built the temple of God, something that his father David, the David, was not able to do because he killed too many people. Then he was the wisest person on the face of the planet where people from all over the world would come and visit him and pay respect to him, pay him and give him all these lavish gifts so that they could hear of his wisdom. Then the dude was so rich that in the kingdom of Jerusalem, did you know, silver became worthless because there was as much silver in the land as there was rocks. Like everything you can think of, this dude had. And so I wanted to be like him and be like, man, that's like, it's like a pastor who grows this big old church and that's all this big stuff, right? But at the same time, I would look at his lows and I'd be like, oh, oh, oh. You, like, you can't ignore them. Let me give you one example. A dude that built the temple and worshiped the Lord and led this fantastic kingdom of Jerusalem for a while. Did you know how he ended his life? He ended his life worshiping idols, and not just any idols. He ended up worshiping, his, uh, worshiping idols that would regularly have child sacrifice as a part of worship. Talk about, like, you know? So I was like, what do I do? I, I, I really didn't know. I was like going back and forth. And then I did what I think many people might do. Oh, I'll just take the good parts of this dude, right? Just take the good parts. But as I try to do that, I realized you can't just take the good parts. Because that's not how this works. Right? It's, not, it's not the movie. It's not the parent who has like a terrible past and looks at the kid and be like, only take the good parts of me. Like, that doesn't work like that in real life. You got to take the good with the bad. Right? So I was like, okay, you can't just do that. And then you can't just, just, just pick and choose what you want. And then as I did so, I realized something even more. I realized, holy moly, I'm Solomon, just not as extreme. Right? Like we all have our good and our bads, our highs and our lows. And so I was like, you actually can't just take the good parts of me and not take the bad parts of me. It doesn't work like that. Anyone who's in a relationship knows this truth. One commentator simply said, Simon's, uh, Solomon's character is one in which the highs and the lows are common to all of us. It's just that Solomon's are magnified to epic proportions. Whether we like it or not, I realize I'm Solomon. We are Solomon to the T's. Our heights will probably never be as high. A little more on that later. And our lows hopefully will never be his lows. But at the same time, we are him. Why? Because we're divided people at the core, aren't we? The title of the sermon, as it suggests, is we are people who have highs and lows of a divided soul. That's who we are we are somehow sinner and saint all at the same time. So then to kind of deal with this, I then tried and I was like, okay, what if I just kind of stay right in the middle, right? Avoid the highs and the lows. And as I did this, I felt my soul dying. Why? Because it's just living this like mm, kind of life where you just go down the middle. And then I felt all of my dreams of glory and goodness and beauty and all that stuff just being crushed in my soul. And I was like, that sucks too. And then I realized, wait, I can't think that way. I'm a pastor. And more importantly, I'm a believer in scripture. And we are people made in the image of the Imago Dei, God himself. You can't live just life like that. That's not how this works. So then more and more, I was just like, what do I do with this dude? I even thought about maybe I'll just, again, teach on somebody else. Or maybe I'll just teach it. Like, I just didn't know what to do. So you know what I did? I took a break. I took a shower. And then I was like, all right, let me see if I can take a look at this and, and figure it out just a little bit differently. And then as I looked, I said, God, show me what you need to show me because I think I'm stuck. And then I saw something and I realized, oh, I have been seeing it wrong the whole time. I have been misidentifying the glories and the beauties and the highs of Solomon's life. I had been misseeing the things that I needed to see. You see, I think when we look at this, and again, a little more on this later, when we look at him, the thing that we want to be motivated by, the thing that we want to example ourselves is all the beautiful things and the wonderful things Solomon did. Many people struggle in their entire lives looking at other people and the successes they might have and be like, oh, I want to be like that person. How come I can't be like that person? How come I can't have... Solomon is that dude. Again, more on it later. And then I realized, oh, I saw it wrong. Because the true highs and the glories and the things that I wish I had... Solomon didn't achieve nor get. He had it from the jump. And so what we want to do this week and next week is to look at Solomon in such a way where we realize 
oh, the glory of life, especially in and through a person like Solomon, isn't everything that he attained and achieved and, and, and acquired, but it's everything he had from the jump. And let me give you a little sneak peek. You have it more than him right now. Okay? That's what we're after. Let's take a look. So, to understand Solomon, you have to begin with his history. Again, more on who he is. Okay? So, give you a recap. Solomon is the second son of David the king and then his wife Bathsheba. If you know the story, David, he did some terrible things with Bathsheba and then her husband Uriah. If you don't know the story, go look it up. Everyone basically knows the story if you grew up in church. But right. So after that, right, um, the first child they have dies early on. And that's God's punishment for the evil that David had done with Bathsheba. But then he gets, she gets pregnant again, and then the second son, Solomon, is born, and God, from the jump, chooses him. He's a chosen, favored, and promised dude to lead the people of Israel after his father, David, who was the best king up until that point. And then as if that kind of promise and expectation wasn't enough, the kingdom that Solomon then inherited was the best kingdom he could have inherited. Let me give you a couple of highlights. All 12 tribes of Israel had been united by that point, and Israel's territory had been solidified. If you are here last week, Pastor Jishan told us that after Solomon, the kingdom gets divided, and it goes to the crapper, essentially, right? It gets terrible. So all tribes are united, Israel's military is top-notch, established, and then all of Israel's enemies have nothing to do with them. And if that weren't enough... King David then did the thing kings are supposed to do in God's kingdom and that he's a lot of solidified worship. He assigned all the priests and all the worship of God had been going pretty smoothly, minus one thing. And the only thing David didn't do was build the temple. And that was because God said, you can't build it. I'm going to build it through Solomon. So Solomon inherited a a, a legacy and and a promise that was immense. And then as I thought about Solomon, I was like, holy moly, this dude is LeBron and Bronny James all at the same time. If you don't know who that is, you don't know sports, which is okay. You don't have to. But that's LeBron, maybe the greatest player of all time. That's his son, Bronny James, or LeBron Jr. Now, he is both of these kids, because, uh, kids, these people because of this. He's Bronny James. Why? Because he's trying to fulfill the promise of his father, living under the shadow of his father, who is a big deal. Now, if you know, Bronny actually got drafted to the Lakers, a team that his dad plays on, and then his dad signed an extension, all that kind of stuff. And everyone's like, oh, that's great. And I thought, is it? It would suck to play on your dad's team if your dad was LeBron. It, it just does. I talk about pressure. Not only do you play on the same team with perhaps the greatest player of all time, but he's your dad. I, I wouldn't want to. Did anyone? Anyone? Anyone take yours? I don't think so. So not only that, but then I realized, oh, wait, but he's LeBron too. Why? Because did you know LeBron was called the chosen one? Literally, when he began his career. Sports Illustrated, the chosen one. But the most fascinating thing about LeBron is everyone knew and thought that he was going to be the next MJ or whatever, but the greatest thing about LeBron is he actually did it. He's actually, perhaps, longevity-wise, like the dude is 40. He's my age, and he's still one of the best players in the NBA. He's still starting for the Olympic team in two weeks. So he did all the things that he's supposed to do, and I was like, oh my goodness, Solomon is, is this dude. Solomon inherited all the promise. Solomon inherited all this stuff. But you know what? Solomon actually did it. Again, I gave you a little glimpse. Let me give you a little more of just how amazing Solomon's life was in terms of all that he achieved. Remember I told you he built the temple? As if that weren't good enough? The temple was filled with what's called the Shekinah glory of God. It's like this like, like thick glory. Like everybody is looking for the Shekinah glory of God. And he built the temple, and that's what came into it. I told you about his prospering, right? How he rich he was, right? Let me give you some examples. First Kings 4. It basically says he has dominion over everything west of the river, right? From Tipshah to Gaza. Basically what this means is he had shalom and peace throughout the entire country for the first time ever in their history. Can you imagine a kingdom that does not have any enemies? We talked about wisdom. Solomon had more wisdom. We find this out in chapter 4, 30, 32. He had so much wisdom that everybody was coming to him, and then he was known to have written 3,000 Proverbs and then 1,005 songs of wisdom. You know the book of Proverbs that 31 Proverbs in it? It's 31 of 3,000 that he wrote. Oh, and the riches. I told you about them. Let me just read 2 Chronicles 9 for you in full. It's not on the screen. 
King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. And all the kings of the earth were seeking the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. They brought every man his gift, articles of silver and gold and garments, weapons, spices, horses and mules, so much year by year. Now Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen. And he stationed them in the chariot cities with the king in Jerusalem. He was a ruler over all the kings from the Euphrates River, even to the land of the Philistines, as far as the border of Egypt. The king made silver as common as stones and made cedars as plentiful as sycamore trees that are in the lowland. Solomon was so loaded, every cup he drank out of was made out of 24 karat gold. He ate with a pure gold spoon and fork or whatever utensils they used back in those days. Like the dude had it all. But at the same time, if you look at the end of his life, which we'll look at later next week, he fell hard. And so again, I was like, what do we do with this dude? What do we do with him? And again, as I told you, I misunderstood what his glories were. It's not the stuff he gained. It's not the stuff he achieved. It's not the stuff that he had done. It's everything he already had. You may have noticed that the scripture that, uh, that we read today had nothing to do with his wisdom, nothing to do with his temple, nothing to do with his riches. We read a story about how he began his reign as king before he did anything and therefore was known for anything. And the reason why is because within these verses, I realized was the very things that I wish I had had. And then, as I told you later, sneak peek, I realized I had them all already and more than Solomon. Let me explain. The scene that we just read, actually, in the scripture is, is a fascinating scene. Right before he, with this scene in, in 1 Kings chapter 1 and 2, right, Solomon's older brother, Adonijah, tries to take his throne from him, sneakily. But thanks to Bathsheba, his mom, and then Nathan the prophet, the th uh, plan gets thwarted, and then Solomon is anointed king. Then in verse 4, we find out that Solomon goes up to Gibeon, which is the great high place, to offer a thousand burnt offerings. That's a lot, by the way. To commemorate the beginning of his reign and all that kind of stuff. A special offering, so good. And then right after the offering, get this, God in a dream appears to Solomon, and then he says the words I think everybody wants to hear. Ask me anything, and I'll give it to you. As soon as I read it, I got total Aladdin vibes. I didn't put a picture of the genie in the book because it's distracting. The difference is obviously Aladdin got three wishes. He only gets one, but Aladdin has a genie. Solomon has God, so I think he won in the long run. But serious, think about it. Ask me anything, and I'll give it to you. What does Solomon ask for? He asks for wisdom. And then we find out that God is so pleased that Solomon asks for wisdom other than, you know, rather than like long life or like, hey, can you kill my enemies, yada, yada, riches, like selfish things. I was reminded again of Aladdin. Aladdin gets three wishes. You know why? Because the first two, he messes up every single time. First time, he goes, what? I want to be a prince. Second time, he's like, save my life. I'm about to die. Third one, he goes, okay, genie, you can be free. But Solomon nails it from the jump. And because God is so pleased with the fact that he asked for wisdom, what does God do? Not only does he give him wisdom, he gives him riches and honor more than anyone else on the planet. You know what that is called? In my life, it's called a bonus. You have to pronounce it like that because it sounds better. Or it's this. Every time you go to a restaurant, if you're Korean, you go to a Korean restaurant, you know the one thing that you want, even more than good food, you know what it is? Subby soup. I heard it over here. See, we're so close to my wife. That's what we look for anyway. If you don't know what that is, when you go to a Korean restaurant, okay, the thing that you really want is when you want the waiter or the owner or someone to kind of know you and recognize you and kind of think that you're nice, that they just give you something for free. So like you'll be eating, and randomly this happens, you'll be eating, and then all of a sudden they'll bring like a plate of like extra dumplings or whatever something, and you're like, oh, what is this? And then the magical word, oh, it's a sobis. And you're like, oh my goodness, like these people love me. That's what God is doing to Solomon, sobis. But not just dumplings or mandu or kimchi or whatever, riches and wisdom and honor that no one in the world has ever had before. Why? Because God is so pleased with the wisdom that Solomon asks for. But again, I think that's what we would want in Solomon's life. But I think we misread it. Because what we miss in this section is that what Solomon has isn't the pleasure of God that might be better. It's what he has is something that is really, really important, a high. You know what he had? It's called self-awareness. Look at verse 6. 
Solomon says, You've shown great loving kindness to your servant David, my father, according as he walked before you in truth and righteousness, uprightness, so on and so forth. You are all those things. You've given him a son to sit on the throne. You know what Solomon's saying? He's saying, I wouldn't be king if it's not for you, God, and my father David. He's saying, I'm not king because of me. I'm king because of God and David. Truth in life that we say here, at least I do all the time, is this. Did you know? No one chooses what family to be born in. None of you did. No one chooses what ethnicity to be born in. None of you did. No one chooses what time period in history to be born in. Again, none of you did. Yes, we all as human beings have agency, autonomy, right, free will to choose things and we're good at it or bad at it or whatever, but the vast majority of who we are, what we are, where we are, why we are, and how we are is not up to our choosing. And Solomon knows this to the T. He realizes, why wasn't I born the firstborn of my parents? I would have died. No, I was a secondborn. Also, why is it that God chooses David through Bathsheba, his greatest sin, to then continue the line of David and not someone other? All this is God's grace, isn't it? All this is what God is doing, right? So we can... Much is made, oh, I went too far. Much is made of, God's, uh, of, of Solomon's wisdom that everyone comes from all over the world to see him and all that kind of stuff, pay him honor. And that's something that we want and it's great and it might be, but you know what I realized? Who cares? Why? Because God gave Solomon that credit first. God appeared to him. So then in verse 7, we see, he says, now, O oh, Yahweh, my God, you've made your servant king in place of my father David, yet I am a little child. I do not know how to come in or go out. What you get when you have an understanding of reality that this life is not of my doing and of God is then you get the humility to be able to say what Solomon says. He goes, what? Yet I am a little child. By the way, Solomon is 20 when he becomes king, not a little kid anymore. But Solomon is being very honest. Why? Because he says, I don't know how to come in and go out. And all of this is fascinating, extraordinary. You know why? I'm not a historian by any means. My son, he likes to read books. He's a lot better than this. But I watch a lot of movies, okay? And in the movies, I like to watch a lot of those like, time pieces of like, histories and kings and wars and all that kind of stuff. They're kind of fun. And in almost all those movies, or a lot of them, you always, this kind of situation happened, right? Some good king dies, and all of a sudden, he's got an like, eight-year-old son. And then the eight-year-old son becomes king. Super early, don't know what he's doing. So they have all these like sages and people who come to the king and you know try to give the king advice. But what does this king do? It's like literally the moment he puts the crown on, like he becomes a totally different person. He becomes a person that knows everything and then he starts killing people and making wrong decisions all over the place. That's how kings have been throughout the history of the world. But not Solomon. He goes, I know nothing. He goes, I do not know. Do you know one of the most important lessons I've learned in life is? how to say three of the most important words in the English language. I don't know. If you thought it was I love you, wrong. Well, I love you is important too, but I don't know. Parents, leaders, teachers, pastors, learn how to say I don't know. And then add the more important words later, but I will try to find out. And what is it that Solomon doesn't know? Well, this phrase, I do not know how to come in or go out, go out and come in, is a he Hebrew idiom that basically says, I don't know how to do much of anything. I don't know how to do the daily activities of my life that allows my life to go onward and forward. Interestingly, little children literally do not know how to go in and come out by themselves. Any parent in here allow their three-year-old to just go out of the house and be like, hi, go spend a couple hours and come back? Nobody does. Why? Because they wouldn't make it. It's something that children do not know how to do. So Solomon gets it. He realizes who he is and what he is, and he realizes, I actually don't know much. I don't know how to rule this kingdom. I don't know how to do these things. Verse 8, he goes, I'm in the midst of your people, which you have chosen, and great people who are too many to be numbered and counted. By the way, that's a reference to Abraham. And so Solomon knows that he does not have what it takes. And yet, to be clear, Solomon isn't like false humility groveling. Somehow, at the same time, though he knows nothing, he realized, wait, I'm still king. I still have responsibilities. I still have things I have to do. You know, they say this, with great power and privilege comes great responsibility. Solomon gets that. And so Solomon asks at the end of verse 9, who else 
could lead or who could lead these great people? It's a rhetorical question. Basically, no one but you, God. The first true high and glory and beauty of Solomon's life is that he understands reality properly. He sees who he is as he is because he is sinner and yet a saint. He is a little child and yet the king. He does not know anything. He has the wisdom to ask for wisdom to rule. The first beatitude is my favorite. It's the most important of Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? Because the poor in spirit get the picture. They get that they don't have anything to win the kingdom, barter for the kingdom, gain the kingdom. They only need God's grace and they'll ask for it and they and they only inherit the kingdom. Church, you can too have this awareness of yourself if you understand who you are in light of the king. So that's the first high. But then there are greater highs. In verse 3, here's what it says. Now Solomon loved Yahweh walking in the statues of his father, David. If you're wondering what allows Solomon to have this sense of reality and view and self-identity, it's his love for Yahweh. A little foreshadowing to next week. At the end of his life, you know what it says? It's sad. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, and Solomon held fast to these in love. Love in scripture, by the way, is not mostly an emotion. It can be, but it isn't mostly. You know what love is in scripture? It's loyalty. It's allegiance. Love is the thing that allows you to follow the thing that you love. Hmm? Love the Lord, you follow the Lord in his ways. Love women or whatever, you follow their ways. And you'll see next week that Solomon indeed, that's where he goes. This is a division in Solomon's heart that we've been referring to, his loves. Yes, his lows and where he ends up is a complex thing of many things, but ultimately the reason why Solomon ends up where he, lo- uh, where, he, uh, where he does is because of his loves. But here's the thing that's crazy about all. The thing he needed and the glory that he needed for his life, he already had. It loved God from the beginning. Because Solomon loved Yahweh, he could readily admit, I am a child, but I'm a king. I know nothing, yet I am wise. I am a sinner, yet I am a saint. Solomon loved Yahweh. When my life is over, church, I hope, whether it's my epitaph or eulogy or whatever the case might be, I hope the thing that I remember for is simply this, that people will say, Pete, that dude loved him, his God. I've said this before but I tell my kids this, my goal as a father isn't that when I die, they would say, oh, my dad loved me a lot. They would say, my dad loved one thing more than anything else in the world, and that is his Lord Jesus Christ. And why, you might say? Because loving the Lord is the best thing that anyone can do, period, isn't it? And did you notice It'd be one thing for people to say that I love the Lord and give me that kind of credit. But for Solomon, God declared that he loved the Lord. The one who wrote the scriptures and inspired it says Solomon loved me, his God. I mean, are there any sweeter words that anyone would want to be known by than this? Well done, my good and faithful servant, and in my addition, you have loved me well. This is the glory that Solomon had. He loved the best thing. What is there better to love than God, the one who created the world, the one who saves the world, the one who defeats death and grave, the one who loves you so much that he would send his only son to die for you so that you would live and that he would die? What glory than to love this God? But then I realize the glories get even better because there's one more that's greater than loving the Lord. And you know what that is? Being loved by him. Sometimes when we read the Bible, we often overlook some of these little details because we think it's nothing. But you know what the most significant detail in this text is for me? It's simply what? That That God appeared to Solomon. Did you catch that? God himself 
appears to Solomon directly. It's not an angel. It's not a sent, sent person. It's God himself. And then God does this on his accord. Solomon doesn't ask for it. Solomon isn't crying out for it. God just does it. And this is not any small thing. You have to understand this is huge. And not only does he appear to Solomon, you know what he says? We went over it. Ask me anything and I'll give it to you. Later on in Solomon's story in chapter 9, God appears again. Unprecedented that he would get two appearances from God. Now, the chapter 9 appearance is a little bit more of a warning than a question. But at the same time, you realize Solomon is a blessed dude. Why? Because God delighted in him. Do you know how Solomon got his name? Fascinating. In 2 Samuel 12, 24, 25, it says this. This is right after David and Bathsheba lose their first son. So David wants to console his wife, and so he does, and then they uh, conceive again, and then Solomon is born, and then so David names him Solomon. Cool. But then look what it says in verse 25. Now the Lord loved him and sent word through Nathan the prophet, and he, God, named him Someone who already had a name, Solomon, but he named him Jedediah for the Lord's sake. Do you know what Jedediah means? The beloved of Yahweh. I said this earlier. People all throughout Solomon's life came from far and wide to come see him and praise him and give him honor. And we'd go, man, what an honor to be known as a guy that everyone in the world knows is the wisest dude on the planet. And then I realized, honestly, who cares? Because God gave him his flowers already. God appeared to him long before that. God had chosen him and named him long before that. And then again, not to belabor a point, and then he gives him more. Subis! Did you know the reason why I make it a joke like that is because that's God's joy spilling over onto his beloved Solomon? Today, interestingly, over on the other side, we're ordaining a bunch of kwonsanims. In Korean, there's a special category for very faithful, right, women who serve the church, and it's called a kwonsanim. Generally, they're a little bit older, elderly. Now, one of the things that kwonsanims do in a Korean church like ours is they host lunch for all the pastors multiple times a year. It's one of my favorite days in the year because they make amazing food. It's so delicious. It's amazing. Best Korean food in the city. And at every single one of these lunches, there's always duck. Korean rice cakes. And if you know me, I love duck. Like it's, mm, I love duck so much. Okay? Now, here's what happens at all these lunches. So I go get a big old plate of food and I eat it because it's delicious. Okay? And then afterwards, because I love me some duck, then I'll go through with a blank plate and then I'll go and get a bunch of duck. And this happens every single time, literally in nine years, every single time, right? I know some Kwanzaanings really well and then there's some that don't know me very well. It's just kind of how it works. So then I go through the line, and then they're kind of serving, and then I go through, and then I'll pick up like one or two, and then I'll pick up three or four, and I'll actually, I get like 10 or 15. And then one of the consignees who don't know me very well will always go, Pastor Pete, you love duck? Because apparently young people are not supposed to love duck for some reason. Like we think it's gross or something. Pastor John, younger than me, doesn't like duck apparently, so maybe that's true. But so then they're like, so then before I can answer, be like, no, I love duck, some other consignee that knows me well will be like, Pastor Pete loves duck. She's so proud that I love duck. I was like, what did I do? And so I take my plate, and then I go back to my seat, and I sit down. You know what happens every single time within 30 seconds? A plate bigger than mine shows up. Pastor Pete, eat all the duck in the world. Take it home. You know what that is? That's their joy spilleth over for me and my love for what they love. Did you know God's joy spilleth over for those who love him and are loved by him? But do you know the most amazing thing about all of this? I told you this, right? Did you know you have that love way more than you could ever think? Yeah, maybe cliche, it's the cross. It's not. It's not. In Christ, as we'll see again next week and over and over and over again, we have love abundant that we can't even imagine and or think on the cross, God who loves us turned his face from his own son, punishing him with his wrath for our sin. Though we deserve to die, he killed his son so that we may not have to die but live with him forever. 
On the cross, he who knew no sin became our sin so that we could be reconciled to him and be united with him forever. And you had that before you were born. You had that before you walked into this room. And you have so much of it, you can't ever get rid of it. So then as I started realizing this, I began to then wonder something very different from before. No longer was I wondering, what do I do with this Solomon dude, right? I wondered. I told you I got Aladdin vibes. I wondered, what do I, what would I say? Right? Ask yourself, what would I say if God appeared to me in a dream? And you knew it was God, right? Just, we knew it. It's God, he's appearing to me, and he goes, Pete Chung, ask me anything, and I'll give it to you. Ask me anything, and I'll give it to you. And then in a moment of clarity, again, the Holy Spirit working, in a moment of clarity, I knew exactly what I would say. It wasn't even a choice. It was simple. If God appeared to me, and he said, Pete Chung, ask me anything, and I'll give it to you, you know what my response would be in light of Jesus Christ, at whom we already have? You know what my answer would be? Simple, nothing, Lord. Why? Because in Christ I already have everything I need and want plus more. I have it all. What more could I possibly need other than your son? Why? Because of Jesus, I'm a sinner, but I'm a saint. Proud. Because of Jesus, I'm wretched, and yet I'm washed totally clean. Because of Jesus, I'm utterly broken and yet bought by the blood of Christ. Because of Jesus, get this, I am dead to my sin and alive in Christ. That's a hallelujah, amen moment if I ever heard one. Because of Jesus, the ball game is different. And you know how I know? To begin Jesus' life, Jesus goes on a mountain and he preaches. We're almost done. You know this? Sermon on the Mount? In the middle of this sermon, there's this section that I've always found fascinating and challenging and all that kind of stuff. It's a section that tells us that we as Christians do not need to be anxious for anything, right? Don't be anxious for this, right? About what you're going to eat, what you're going to put on, this and this and that. Famous passage. I was reading it, and then something jumped out at me, and I went, mm. let me read it for you, really slow. This is Jesus, by the way. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? He goes, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? Why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor they spin. Yet I say to you, and then get this, yet I say to you, remember, look at the birds. I take care of them all. They don't do nothing. Look at the lilies of the field. They don't do nothing. And yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all of his glory clothe himself like one of these, a.k.a. you are so much more beautiful and glorious and well-clothed than even Solomon who had all those riches that he drank from a gold cup. Why? Because Jesus... Jesus has secured your future that cannot be taken from you. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow's thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? Of course he will. You of little faith, do not worry then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. In Jesus we have it all. And in Jesus, because of the highs, we need not worry about the lows. We'll look about it next week. Why? Because his highs, knowing him, protects us from all of Solomon's lows. Christian in the room, do you know that you have this love now? You have it in spades 
or from my early example, you have it more than the plate overfloweth with Korean rice cakes. You have it so much more than you ever recognize, and you have it so that you can love him and know who you are and why you are and how you are. All you must do is to freely receive it, knowing that he wants to give it to you. God says to Solomon multiple times in his life, if you walk in my ways, follow my statutes, then your life, I'll take care of it. Jesus says, seek first my kingdom and everything else, I'll give it to you. Will you seek our Lord, our God, who has from the beginning loved you more than you'll ever know? Will you then be spurred to love him because he's loved you first and then realize that you are indeed everything you want to be Sinner, yet a saint. A little child, and yet a prince, or a queen, or beloved of God. Broken, but completely alive. And in doing so, then give all your praise to him, for he is worthy. Will you receive this grace, this mercy, and this love? Receive the highs of the great Solomon, and know that you have way more than you could ever ever dream. And then in return, as you pray, then sing glory to his name.